from her chambers in Washington, D.C. Please welcome Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor to the TAM fam. Words I never thought I'd be able to say on the show. Thank you. It is such a great honor to have you here with us. Hello, Tamron. What a pleasure to meet you, even if only virtually. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have this beautiful book next to me, which is now also in my son's room. And I can't wait to talk with you about the inspiration and the message behind it. The I illustrations. It's, it's stunning. The illustrations are beautiful, aren't they? They are. I can't Angela, Angela Dominguez, who's my illustrator, did a wonderful job. Absolutely. And that was one of the things that struck me. Now that I have a two and a half year old, I have to say, yes, I judge the content, but the illustration is the very first thing I see <laughs> when I'm bringing it into my son's room. Before we talk, Justice more about this beautiful book, I did want to talk with you. I know that there are um, rules, for lack of a better description, in that you don't talk about specific cases or controversies that would negatively impact the Supreme Court. Um, you have said, and, and I, I saw an interview where you said you and the justices away from court love to talk about movies. You stay away from politics or religion. I think like a lot of families at the dinner table, you want to avoid certain things. Um, but there is, as you well know, this recent article that was reported uh, that has caught the attention of a lot of viewers, people who are preparing to go back into the workplace, and they saw the headline related to the fact that you have type 1 diabetes, something you were diagnosed with when you were seven and a half years old, and that you've been working from your chambers. It was reported that you did not, or that you do not feel safe being around people who are unmasked. And this led to an unpre unprecedented thing, to be honest. You and Justice Neil Gorsuch released a rare statement together um, saying that reporting that Justice Sotomayor asked Justice Gorsuch to wear a mask surprise us. It is false. While we may sometimes disagree about the law, we are warm colleagues and friends. And to add to that, Chief Justice Roberts released his own statement saying he, or quote, I did not request Justice Gorsuch or any other justices to wear a mask on the bench. Is there any more context that you are comfortable adding to this as people don't often understand cases and the notes that go along with it, but this is at the heart of what so many people are experiencing right now. Is there any more context you can add to it? I feel blessed that I have a job where I can take a choice to protect myself. There are many, many people, Tamron, you, who you know, who don't have that alternative, who are forced to physically go into work. I can thankfully work virtually. And so I've made a choice for myself to do that because it's safer for me. Um, as I tell people, I'm a very healthy juvenile diabetic. I've had my condition now for over 60 years, believe it or not. It seems like a long time it is. Um, but I'm relatively healthy, uh, thankfully. But I stay that way because I pay attention to my health the way I think most people should. And so I, for myself, believe that I should be masked. And when I'm not uh, others are because here I am with you virtually and I do have people in the room, but they're far away and they're masked. Um, I take as much care as I can. Each individual has to make that choice for themselves. And I think that it's important to remember that people feel differently about these issues. And you don't have to um, engage in negative, negative colloquy with friends or colleagues about the question. You can engage in conversation around it and, uh, and respect the choice that each person is making. And that's the best or the most that I can say about that situation with respect to my work environment. I'm choosing to be safe. I appreciate your answer there. I do want to move on to the show today, which is about trusting your gut. And it's something that you've spoken about often. Um, and you have said that women say things and they are not heard in the same way that men who might say the identical thing. The court um, made changes due to the fact that studies pointed out women justices were interrupted so often um, that it had become an issue. For you in your life, being very vocal and, and very unapologetic about that Bronx background and, and all of the things that your family poured into you, how have you trusted or learned to trust your gut 
even in this role, regarding when, as Kenny Rogers said, hold him, fold him, walk away, run, but no, standing <laughs> there and talking and speaking from your perspective and not shrinking down? Um, Tamron, I tell um, students when I speak to them about this issue um, that knowing when to fold them, when to hold them, um, is really, uh, it really comes to an effect by understanding the environment around you. It's critically important that when you go into any situation, you understand what your purpose there is. And that as you're interacting with people, you understand their purpose and that you try to put yourself in their place to understand where they're coming from. And once you have that sort of situation evaluated, then you have a better informed sense of what to do. Because you can't treat every situation identically. I talk in my book about various moments in my book, My Beloved World, my memoir. I talk about various moments when I confronted situations about race that were very, very uncomfortable or about gender treatment that were very uncomfortable. And in each situation I treated, that situation uniquely based on the participants and what my purpose was in what I was doing. So I'll give two examples only, okay? When I was a district court judge, I was parking in the court parking lot. And one of the uh, court officers who guard the building and who assist us in uh, parking, because we had a very tight parking space, helped me uh, move into a tight space. And as I was leaving, he said, um, thanks, honey. Oh. Or I said, or something like that. And I stopped and my back went up. Here I am a judge and he's using the word honey to me. And my first instinct was, um, you know, why is he addressing me that way? And I thought about it and I realized that I had a very friendly relationship with him. Every day that I drove in and he helped me, I would stop and talk to him. I would talk about his kids and his wife and what they were doing and vacations and things of that nature. He liked me, not in any way other than as a friend. And so that came out, I understood, unintentionally on his part, without thinking, but it was still inappropriate. And so I thought a second about it and looked at him and said, you know something, if someone heard you call me honey, they might think the wrong thing about us. Might be better if we just stuck to judge. Um, it wouldn't give a bad impression. Mm. And I walked away from that situation. He never called me honey again. I bet he didn't. <laughs> I'm sure he didn't. Now, I was in an incident in law school Mm. where an interviewer asked me questions that I thought were very inappropriate about why Princeton had a, Princeton and Yale had accepted me. Mm. He asked very directly if I had been accepted merely because I was Puerto Rican. Mm. I found the question insulting. Um, I was at a group dinner with uh, other classmates. This was a, a recruiting dinner. I told him that I thought perhaps not, that there were many other characteristics that I brought to the table, that uh, he hadn't even seen my resume yet, but if he had, it would have been a bit more insulting because I had graduated Phi Beta Kappa Summa Cum Laude from Princeton University wow. and had received one of the top student graduating prizes at that university. And at Yale, I had done fairly well as well. And so it was a, a question that was inappropriate for any recruiter to be asking a potential applicant. If he didn't think I was qualified, he didn't have to interview me. Mm. He didn't have to insult me at the same time. And I went back that night and thought about what my response should be. And I thought, should it be personal? Should I go into him and complain? And I thought, no, no, this interview was public. And how many other people of color like me have been subjected to similar interviews? And how many have the power 
to say something publicly like I have. Right. Not everyone. And so I filed a public complaint with the university. And at the time, it received a lot of attention from a lot of people. And I received letters from across the country from students. This was before the age of email, so it was just letters. I received letters from students around the country telling me about similar incidents. That was a situation in which I thought about what was the right thing to do. And that required a different response than the exchange with the court officer. And so when you talk about instinct, it should always be instinct informed, gut, right. informed by knowledge. Right. Don't go into situations blindly. Always know where you're at, what your purpose is, and always understand what is it I want to accomplish. And is this the best way to do it? That's mm. what I tell young lawyers all the time. What it is, what when you're approaching a legal issue, think about what do you need to do? Why? Right. Is find a way to do it and then think about do I have a better way to do mm. it? And act only until you've answered those questions. 